Diego. Started my first business when I was 18, became a millionaire at 19. Our guest today is Luca Netz, a serial entrepreneur who sold for more than $500 million in consumer packaged goods, the CEO and owner of Pudgy Penguins, Web3's leading IP company. What do you think of Miami? I like Miami. I think uh, it has an interesting crypto culture, an interesting NFT culture, an interesting hub for young entrepreneurs. I talk about it a lot, so I won't bore the audience with sob story, but- What was the first business? Selling jewelry online. What kind of jewelry? Fake gold chains and cubic zirconia diamonds. Why did you choose that? It has this dark side. I couldn't afford school. So going into debt to get a degree didn't seem like something a good businessman would do. This industry in general, Web3, NFTs, whatever it may be, I think is marketing and branding. And I think I do that the best in the space. And so- Who else do you think in crypto is doing a decent job at that? Uh, grew up homeless and then you start your business and fairly quickly you become a millionaire. Like how do you react when you make this money that quickly? I've gone through so much pain and suffering in my life. I knew the value of a dollar and I didn't mess it up. I didn't go and party and go spend tons of things on cars and stuff. You talk about being a people pleaser. Yeah. I'm also one. <laughs> but you're able to make a difference between business and the real life now. Yeah. How do you do that? Enlighten me. Uh... Seventh one, lucky number seven. Give you the best one. Let's do it. Um, yeah, man, seven podcasts, but like it's just flew by, flew by like crazy. And I was really looking forward to this one. Thank you. Because you're a special, special dude. I'm trying to be. How are you doing? I'm doing good. How are you? Very good. On fire, actually. I was thinking, man, I would be exhausted after seven podcasts in a day, but I'm actually more on fire than ever before. Uh, you know, I'm, at the moment when you build the momentum and you just, mm, I mean, you know it, you're in the yeah. flow, basically. I'm in uh, my fifth Asian city in the last 14 days. So unfortunately, I'm not, uh, I don't have the same energy that you do, I'll, uh, but I'm going to give you my best. I'll give you some of mine. Please. Feel it in the, uh, in the atmosphere. I'm where, feeling it. You're hyping me. Where did you, <laughs> where did you go before? I mean, Korea, but where before? Yeah, I was in Japan. So I was in Osaka, Tokyo. Then I was in Seoul, one other city I forget, and now Singapore. Okay. In 12 days. What did you do? Tokyo, all... huge meetings with a bunch of, you know, Tokyo is the hub of IP. And so we'll get into this in a sec. But, you know, for Pudgy Penguins, I want to be one of the world's next great characters. Mm -hmm. And five of the 10 biggest characters in the world have come out of Tokyo. And so mm -hmm. Tokyo is really the home of this stuff. Uh, I went there to meet with, uh, you know, some big companies that are, that are based out of their uh, distribution and other IP collaborators. And then I also just wanted to understand the culture. I've never been to Asia before. So I was just trying First to, okay. yeah, I was trying to squeeze it all in. Okay. Seoul, uh, you know, Korea Blockchain Week, a couple of the other cities. I went to sightsee. That was a mistake. Uh, and now Singapore for Token 2049. What was your favorite place? I love Asia. I thought, I thought America was the most advanced. And mm. I totally, being here, I'm like, these people are eons ahead of what we are in America and Europe. On and you haven't been to China. Because China, China is like next level. Really? It's a very different culture. So people might like or not like it, but in terms of technological advancement and everything, here is like 2000 years bef before uh, before China I, is like I, much more advanced. I, I, couldn't, I can't believe it. I thought America was eons ahead of everybody and it's not the case. Uh, so it's been fascinating to watch. I love the people. I love the food. I love the culture. I love how quiet it is in busy areas. I love it. It's, 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 a, it's a culture built on respect, and I appreciate mm. it. Uh, I appreciate the system and processes. I mean, it's just an unbelievable world. If you've never gone, I highly recommend anyone listening uh, to come to Asia at least once. Uh, it's mind-blowing. And so I love the people. I love it. I love every city that I've been to. But for me specifically, I'm like a culture bug. We'll get into this. Uh, I'm very much, I think, in the culture business. And Tokyo is just special. Mm. So. Tokyo has my heart, but I love everywhere else, you know, just as much, just maybe Tokyo 1% more. Where are you based? I'm in Miami and in LA. So our team nice. is based in Miami, but I have a home in LA. So I bounce back and forth, but uh, mainly Miami. What do you think of Miami? Um, I like Miami. I think uh, it has an interesting crypto culture, an interesting NFT culture. I think uh, it's uh, an interesting hub for young entrepreneurs. It has this dark side. Uh, I think like most cities, I love Los Angeles as well, but uh, I'm happy to have my, my, my main home in Miami. What do I need to know about your early context to understand better the Luca who is standing today in front of me in this studio? Yeah, I, I talk about it a lot, so I won't bore the audience with the, with the sob story, but... 
home, like just me and my mom and my brother. So single mom, uh, grew up homeless for 10 years, not homeless, sleeping in a shelter, but bouncing around home to home, couch to couch for about 10 years, staying in one place between six to 12 months at a time. Uh, so I've stayed everywhere to, you know, the hood in New York City, to the hood in LA, to the Hamptons in LA, to Beverly Hills in LA, just bouncing around it. Whoever my mom's friend, uh, whatever friend would let us stay on the couch and my mom would try to take care of the home. We did that for about 10 years. Uh, my mom was finally able to get a job and find some stability, but we still grew up really poor. I dropped out of high school when I was 16. I got my first job at a tech startup called Ring. I was throwing underground raves and rap shows while working at Ring. Why did you drop out of high school? I couldn't afford, uh, I wanted to be a businessman. And uh, I couldn't afford school. So going into debt to get a scholar, uh, going into debt to get a degree didn't seem like something a good businessman would do. So what did your mother say? You know, most people who grew up with a single mom as a young man, I think your mom can't really control you as a young man. But you did know? she say something? She, they, because despite, I mean, parents, like they have this idea of like, oh, the, you know, the, the, the safe classic path. Yeah. Did, I, did she think the same for you? No, no, because our situation, so she Airbnb'd our house. We had a basically just a one bedroom apartment that she would Airbnb. And so her and I were just basically living together in the living room pretty much. And, you know, what are you going to tell, what are you going to say to your kid? Your kid's saying he wants to go make money. He wants to go, you know, produce. And you're over here, like making two grand a month in Los Angeles. Like, what are you going to say to that? Mm -hmm. So she knew, but I tested out of school. I say I dropped out and, but it's kind of the same thing, but I took a test called the Chespi. So in California, that's a, that's a test. So I, I, I was able to go to college afterwards. It's not the same thing as dropping out. It's a little bit harder. Um, so I tested out, got a job at ring, did the underground rap and rave shows and, uh, started my first business when I was 18, became a millionaire at 19. What was the first business? Selling jewelry online. What kind of jewelry? Fake gold chains and cubic zirconia diamonds. Why did you choose that? Uh, because hip hop was the fastest growing trend in America. And I thought, how does kid, how do kids look like, how can kids look like their favorite rappers? Mm. And, uh, well, gold chains and jewelry is really expensive, but for a hundred dollars, I can make you look like your favorite rapper. So you have this idea on one side, but then you need to execute on all the distribution side. Yeah. How did you manage that? Drop what shipping. Drop shipping yeah. through what platforms? Uh, Amazon and Alibaba, but really early on, I only did that for the first six months. So I think drop shipping is a good mechanism if you've got absolutely no money, but I, I realized really early on the shipping times and the pain points. So the second, the, the first hundred grand I made, I bought a bunch of inventory and started shipping it out of the States. What about the marketing channels you were using? I, uh, I was one of the first people to really do influencer marketing. I was like, on, I, I was on Instagram. Or? Yeah. I kind of pioneered it. So to give you some context, uh, I wanted rappers to promote my fake chains, mm -hmm. uh, but I couldn't afford them. So what I would do is I would go to rapper fan pages. So let's say, you know, rapper is Kendrick Lamar or something. Uh, I couldn't afford a million dollars to get Kendrick Lamar to promote, but Kendrick Lamar dot fan page on Instagram had a hundred thousand followers and all of Kendrick Lamar's diehard fans. So I'd go to Kendrick Lamar dot fan page on Instagram and I say, I'll pay you a hundred dollars for a story or an Instagram post. And I'd pay him a hundred dollars and make me a thousand dollars back. And I would do that all day for For months and then eventually I scaled it really big and I started paying the rappers themselves. When is that exactly? Uh, 2016 is when it started. So just turned 18. Uh, first couple of months, I kind of, the first couple of months it was, wasn't working. And then I figured out the whole influencer strategy within three months of me figuring that out. I went from, you know, $20,000 a month to half a million a month to multi-million dollar months when I was 18, 19 years old. Mm. And that's when you realize actually it's all about Marketing. Marketing. All about marketing. Yeah. Absolutely. You can have the best processes, the best product ever. No. If no one knows what you're doing. And today with social media, it's absolutely amazing. Yeah. A lot of people see the social media stuff as, oh, it's not good. People are glued. But if you're, if you're a producer of content or if you use the content the right fashion, like this, it's a gold mine. It's and, really amazing. And, and that's why I love being in this space right now because I believe in crypto. I believe in the blockchain. Uh, but I think one of the Achilles heel of the space is I think uh, the two Achilles heel in crypto and just this industry in general, Web3, NFTs, whatever it may be, I think is marketing and branding. And I think I do that the best in the space. And so uh, I'm happy to bring my talents to a new world. Who else do you think in crypto is doing a decent job at that? 
is there anyone? Because actually, the, the, just the user experience is, is really bad. I think, I think they do parts of it good. I think, peop- I, think, I think crypto puts an emphasis on technology and really great technical minds. And that's great. We need that. Obviously, there's so much friction and so much buried entries of that. And so I'm not knocking that. I have so much respect for people with technical brains. I'm not that. Mm. But I think there's such a side to this on one side of the spectrum you have you know technical savvy and the importance of the technicalities and on the other side you have branding and consumer products it's like crypto is very much in the space right now where it's you know ibm and microsoft with computers but nobody knows how to package it like apple and macintosh Mm -hmm. and brand it in that way and so i think i'm kind of coming in and creating our version and, and doing to the space what Apple and Macintosh did to computers, uh, I think we're do, we're going to do for crypto and the blockchain. I think the, the tech is there, it's clunky, and they're going to figure it out. But how do you package it in a non-intimidating way? The problem with crypto is everyone tries to sell it like the front end. Everyone thinks that's the hook. Mm-hmm. That's the drying power. But it's not. It's, it's what powers the experience. It's the back end. Yeah. And I think that is the misconception in crypto today. So you grew up homeless and then you say you start your business and fairly quickly you become a millionaire like how do you react when you make this money that quickly especially with that background yeah it, it was tough um and, and i didn't i didn't go down a crazy rabbit hole like i i've gone through so much pain and suffering in my life that i knew i knew the value of a dollar and i didn't mess it up i didn't go and party and go spend uh you know tons of things on cars and stuff but did you did you have an imposter syndrome or something? Especially if you come from like a, a, a I mean, for example, for me, I'm not from a poor background, but like yeah. from normal one. Yeah. I felt like an imposter in 20, 2021. Like really, I was feeling terrible. I I was uh, I took the moment for granted. I think is what I did. I kicked so in the early days of e-commerce, and there's earlier days than when I started, but I was still in the early days when I became rich off of e-commerce and direct consumer. I was making so much money doing so little work because I had a formula, right? Yeah. Product, shipping, fulfillment, influencer post, yeah. machine. You, it was a very simple system. And I was, you know, making a hundred, two hundred thousand dollars a day. Um, and I could have made so much more. I could have, I could have been Fashion Nova before Fashion Nova. I didn't really, what I didn't focus on in my younger years was enterprise value. I wasn't worried about building equity. I was worried about cash flow and how much money I could put in my bank at the end of every month. And that was the mistake because everything was so easy. I mean, you'd literally click, click a couple buttons on Facebook ads and you know a couple in, a couple influencer campaigns and you'd make generational wealth. But the problem is it wasn't really generational wealth unless you built enterprise value. And so now my only focus is enterprise value. I don't even care, you know, cash flow is cash flow, but that's the business that I'm in. But in that moment in time, I was sitting behind, uh, sitting at a pool in the biggest house in Miami at the time, which was Bay Harbor, uh, in Bay, nicest neighborhood in Miami with the biggest house. And I was just chilling when in reality, I should have been trying to kick it up a notch and a bigger notch. I didn't have a vision when I was younger. And I think that was the problem. Do you think this is not normal? I think it's probably normal, especially when wealth happens fast. Yeah. To, that you have a moment where you are, I don't want to say almost losing drive, but you're like, I mean, you're essentially you're losing a bit of drive, which is a problem as an entrepreneur. You become kind of, you can't be really happy without the drive. And when things are too easy, you still think, especially when you're young and maybe it's the first time it happens, you think, why would I struggle that much to think more when all this shit is so easy? It's funny you bring it up because it's uh, it's being comfortable and and co- being comfortable is the, is uh, leads to complacency and complacency leads to failure, yeah, right? Totally. And so it's funny you bring it to that. <laughs> it, it, it's funny you bring this up because that I think that's my problem with the NFT space, right? One of the reasons why I came in is because so many guys and groups and gals made tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars for doing nothing. Yeah. So they got rewarded for this terrible behavior which led them to be comfortable. I mean, just an ex, no, nobody earned their cash. 
nobody in the NFT space earned the money that they made. Nobody. I think anybody who would say otherwise is a fool. Like nobody earned the money that they got. So in the sense that there is no actual profitable business or company behind anything they've done. It's it, just, there's just no movement. Yeah, there was no, you know, if anything, anyone who only person who kind of came close to them, I mean, Yuga Labs, you know, definitely there there were some like people underestimate the influencer marketing masterclass they put on and some of the business developments that they did, you know, a good BD team. So, you know, there's probably an exception there somewhere, but I mean, everybody else made a pretty picture, you know, minted it on the blockchain, made tens of millions of dollars, you know, thought everything was great, price went up. And then when price started going down, didn't know what to do. Hmm. And that's where I came in and I said, I'm going to show you guys what to do and how to do it. So just before jumping into that, mm. you talk about this easy, how easy it was because of like early influence for marketing. How long did this easy period last? Three years. It doesn't last forever. Three years. Three and then it got time. hard. Okay. Got really hard. What did you, what, what was the first thing that made you realize, oh man, this is not the same game anymore? Uh, I, I just, it just, for two years, we would just make more money every month. And then we started making less. And then I, then I took it seriously and I was like, okay, well, I want to make more again. And I couldn't. Uh, and then, then the power of brand. So a lot of a lot of my peers who were making lesser money, who started at the same time as as me, started to kind of go like this, and I started to kind of go down. And I was trying to figure out why, and it's because they they had done the dirty work and the hard work to build a brand and to build lifetime value and customer retention. These are the things I wasn't focused on. I was focusing on how many new customers could I get to buy processes my product. Processes over brand. Yes, it processes over brand. The system and mm -hmm. in reality, like. You want to optimize for lifetime value. You want to optimize for brand integrity. And these are the things, again, I got rewarded for bad behavior, right? I got rewarded for selling high margin product, you know, as fast, getting it to the customer as fast as possible and then not caring if they purchased again. But it's all about how many times they purchase over our life cycle. I mean, that's, that's, that's what's acquirable. That's enterprise value, right? So, so what do you do at that moment when you realize, oh man, it's harder? Yeah, my it was it was crazy because then by I started doing a lot of venture investing. So I've deployed five million dollars of my own capital across maybe 30 different businesses, a lot of which, you know, some of which have failed, but a lot of which have done really well. Uh, I started doing a lot of that because I was a cash flow king. I was kind of known for this, the king of cash flow. Like nobody was really I was kind of known as the golden boy for many years, in, at least in Los Angeles. That was kind of like the the aura around me because nobody was really making cash like I was. Like I was buying homes out the wazoo, cars, out, like no one was really, really doing it. I felt like the way that I was doing it. And so I started venture investing because I thought that was the highest impact use of my cash. Better than I'm, buying cars. Better than buying cars. Oh. That was a waste. That was such a foolish thing. But I, I started, uh, you know, putting that money into venture investing. I thought that was the way that I was going to create an impact. And as the, as the cash flow started to decrease, an opportunity came around to kind of bring back a company called Von Dutch, which you're probably familiar with being, uh, you know, Swiss and, and French. And so that that showed me my capability because what I had done is I had built such an insane network with all of these influencers. Nobody was paying influencers the way that I was for many years. I was, you know, then Fashion Nova came along and, and a lot of these brands started doing what I was doing. But in the early days, influencers weren't making any money. So I was the guy paying them $1,000 for a post, five grand for a post, 10 grand for a post. And I was really the man. And then I did the same thing with Von Dutch. And I realized what my formula and what my playbook was capable of, but with a brand that was like really hot, high quality, high integrity product. And then that made me realize like the true power that I possess and what I had learned over the last couple of years. Right. I, I, cause you know, Von Dutch went from a nothing, a dead brand to a hundred million dollar company in 12 months when I, when I came around. What did you do for, for them? I just, I, I applied what I call the playbook. So I have this thing that I've developed. Well, Von Dutch made me realize that I had a playbook. So I developed what I call a playbook, which is this formula that I apply to businesses. I either, you know, join or that I start. Uh, that is like a, a formula that if I, I rinse and repeat it now three times and it's worked every time where I kind of just plug this playbook into the, this playbook in this system into this business and it just works. And so I can't give you the details of what the playbook looks like because every competitor watching probably would like to know, but that's very much my formula and what makes me, I think so special. What was your role there? Uh, basically marketing. I was like marketing. leading the whole marketing chart. So I'm a marketer at heart. That's my specialty. So you did, did that for 12 months, 12 months. And then, well, so I worked, I, Oh, 
sorry, I worked out a gross revenue deal with them. So they were making no money. And so I basically, I, I don't, I don't work for retainers or for salaries or anything like that. I, I basically said, if I make, I knew I was going to make them rich. So I said, I want a percentage of gross revenue. So uh, let's say you did a million dollars a month. I wanted a, you know, let's call it 10% of that. Mm -hmm. uh, and so by the time I left, they were making millions of dollars a month. Uh, and I took a, basically a top uh, a top gross line percentage of that number. And so when it came to resign our agreement, we have a 12 month agreement. I thought because I had made them so much money, they would do what anybody does, which is, hey, you you did what you said you were going to do. You made us rich. We're going to give you what I would call the supermax, right? If LeBron James comes to Los Angeles and says, I'm going to win you a championship this year, and he does, what do you do? You know, give him a rookie contract? No, you give him the supermax, and you back up the Brinks truck, and you say, thank you, keep doing this. They didn't do that. They basically took my contract from a supermax to a rookie contract, and I said, screw you guys. And then I went uh, a couple months later, I, you know, invest in this company called Gel Blaster, which ends up being North America's fastest growing toy company. What you learn from this Van Dutch experience? Uh, my, really, my power of the like what I what what I could do if I was behind a brand, mm. like a real brand, right? Ron Van Dutch is a real brand. What's your crypto aha moment? Ah, uh, my brother is a really tech savvy. He he didn't even call himself a nerd, but he's like a nerd. Uh, <laughs> and and I just you Did know you consider yourself a nerd? No, no, no. But there's a part of me that is. <laughs> There's definitely a part of it. I mean, I, 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 I do things that a lot of nerds do. <laughs> For uh, example? Uh, just command and conquer video games, uh, stare at, like... I'm not technically savvy. The, the numbers start breaking at a certain point for me. My mm -hmm. brain is not programmed that way. I'm very much an EQ, high EQ individual, not a high IQ individual. And so uh, that's kind of the discrepancy for me. But in 2017 or 2016... Uh, Bitcoin started doing its thing. I started making some money. My brother was really into it. And then I invested. I maybe had like 40 1080 Ti's, AMD 1080 Ti's running in my mom's apartment at the time. So, but it was like, and so incredibly hot, but we just believed we were mining the wrong thing. We were mining Digibyte, which just didn't end up going okay. anywhere. <laughs> yeah. Uh, on BitMEX, moving all the, the funds to BitMEX. But we, I spent, I was basically <laughs> taking all of my money and buying AMD because There's something I learned really early on. I had read it or I had heard it from somewhere. But, you know, when you have businesses that, you know, lean into what we call basic human rights, they always are the businesses with the most upside, i.e. the cell phone and the ability to communicate with one another. Communication is a basic human right. So if you empower communication, that's going to be a really great business. Ended up being one of the great businesses of all time. Social media, same thing. It's a basic human right to be able to socialize with others that are distanced away from you as long as technology permits it. Highest upside businesses of all time. The ability to transact freely without a middleman is a basic human right. Yeah. There shouldn't be a person in the middle of that. So that made sense to me. And so I was always looking for many years. I was a little more advanced than maybe my peers. But when I was 15, 16, I was always looking for the next basic human right. I'd learned this really early on. And, you know, the second I started learning about entrepreneurship, I had read this in some, digested it somewhere that made me like keen to this. Applying patterns, basically. Exactly. The human right pattern. You know, where, where is that next? Yes. And so it was crypto. And so I knew crypto was going to be the one. 2017 happened. I was a Litcoin litanaire. Is it just is it be, is it because um, is it because you were like oh the technology or the potential is amazing or Bitcoin is amazing or is it because you look at the talents even if there is nothing like concrete out there you look at the talents for me was that I was like man mm -hmm. all the dudes I've been following you know Balaji Chamath all these dudes yes. they're in 2000, Naval 2012 13 like and some of them they went all into crypto like there must be a freaking yeah. reason and that was five six years ago so like. I'm going to follow, and a lot of people hate on crypto, yeah. which is a good sign. So I'm yeah. going to follow these dudes. That was, that's the right thesis. And that's, and that's my thesis today, right? That, that's why I go. So one thing I didn't do, and this was really good advice, but one thing I didn't do was I didn't really put my money, all my chips on high conviction plays. I would always like dip and dabble. And I think a lot of investors do this. Now, when I have a high conviction play, I put it all in, mm -hmm. right? Or like a lot in. So What I, th that is very much my thesis today. So now like my, 
crypto is a high conviction play for me. I'm pretty much all in, right? Before then, I was risk adverse. Remember, I just made it. So I didn't want to go lose all my money and, and things like that. And I was based off the pattern. I wasn't, I hadn't reached that curve of like, oh, who is Chamath? Who is Naval? I didn't know any of those people at the time. I knew, I knew Steve Schwartzman. I knew Bill Gates. I knew Steve Jobs. Yeah. Those are the people I wasn't, remember, I'm like 17, 18. I'm, I don't have that yeah. depth of knowledge that probably you did at the time. Um, but I bag held 2017. I ran it all the way to the top. We bag held it all the way to the bottom. Classic. <laughs> yeah. Watch coin market cap every day until 2020. But I was just buying, you know, just every little check that I could. But again, not high conviction. Now, this time around, I'm just putting all the chips to the table because I believe it's going to happen again. Same. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And people, for some reason, are depressed again. Yeah. Like, ah, it's not going to happen. No, Why is, would it go is, up? No. It's because of money printing and yeah. COVID 2020. Dude, Probably, no. Probably, but like, no. It's coming back. Like, obviously, it's coming back. Just obviously. about the time. Now's the, now's when you should be figuring out ways to make money to buy some. Yeah. Not when it's up like this. I learned that the hard way. Absolutely. I was the king of buying things when it's up like this. I love buying things when it's up like this. I don't like buying things when it's like that. But money is made when you're buying things like that. You really have to understand that if you want to succeed just in stocks, any any financial markets. You got to buy. If you believe in something, if you fundamentally believe in something, you buy it when it's down, not when it's up. So you have these big conviction you accumulate 2019 2020 then things go crazy yep and then 2021 something happens yeah then uh nfts come around and that just makes so much sense to me so growing up poor every time there was a show and tell at a school or all my friends always had the nice things i never had anything nice and so i was a huge collector of just watches and art and collectibles and when nfts mm -hmm. came around it clicked to me i said wow i ran out of wall space in my home in la i can't put any more paintings up and this was just a great way to fulfill my collecting need without having to uh you know just deal Deal with the chaos of what physical collecting really entails. Physical collecting is a pain in the butt. What's the first NFT that really struck? So I was buying one of one art, like Fuocious and things like that, some okay. of the high-end things. But my first ever PFP that I bought, which I think changed, I was collecting more for fun. But the once the PFPs came around, my first one was a Pudgy Penguin. Remember, I didn't, I, I bought Pudgy Penguins. I didn't create them. And uh, when I bought that Pudgy Penguin, it just gave me a bug. I bought, people don't know this, but I had like hun, like a hundred at one point. Uh, and I was just trading it all the way up, all the way into like four or five ETH, which we you know Penguins topped out in 2021. And that was my first big win. And when you basically take 10 grand and turn it into 500 grand, trading little profile pictures, get into Bored Apes, you start doing the rest. And all the, like that was my guilty hobby. I actually have a funny story. Hasbro wanted to buy, uh, buy the company Gel Blaster out. And we were sitting at a boardroom meeting. Uh, literally the whole board of Hasbro was there. It was like a big deal. We were going through due diligence and just negotiating terms. And I was minting mutants and telling them all about these board apes like right there. I mean, I was addicted to this shit, dude. I, I swear nothing. Literally, I got a, you got a nine figure acquisition deal that we're negotiating. And I'm literally on my phone with my friend next to me, like on MetaMask, like minting mutants. I, this I, I, this is the nerd side. Yes. Definitely. Exactly. Did you do the same mistakes with NFT that you did with tokens no. in the previous cycle? Or? No, same with this cycle. I didn't make the mistake. I mean, obviously, you bag held some things, but, you know, I, once it got to a certain price, I was like, I'm out. I don't care. Like, I'm not going to, I'm not, there was a certain number. Obviously, there were certain trades that I could have made better, but, like, there was a certain number where I took every, I took a lot of things off the table. So, 2021? You decide to buy the Pudgy Penguins. Yeah, it was a, I'm not going to bore you with that story because it's a long story, but something in my gut, whether, you know, I believe in God, so call it God, but the universe, uh, the universe or God, whatever you believe in, really put this one in my lap. And so I had no intention of buying an NFT project. I actually wanted to buy one of my friends um, early on, probably six months before, but he just wasn't having it. And so I kind of gave up my dreams of owning an NFT project. And then this happened. And to me, Pudgy Penguins had all... You know, Mind you, rewind a little bit. I was the CMO of the North America's fastest growing toy company, which is Gel Blaster, exposed me to this world of toy and IP. Mm. And if you look at Pudgy Penguin, something in my gut told me that this was perfectly positioned to go meet all of these products and all of this IP that I was seeing at these Disney conferences and Warner Bro. Like I, I was going to these things all the time, almost once a month. And 
I knew that Pudgy Penguins was perfectly positioned to be that from the name to the art to the character. The community was so strong. I mean, think about how many NFT projects rugged that went to zero. Pudgy Penguins never went to zero. And that thing was a rug pretty, pretty clearly early on. Mm -hmm community was so strong the holder base was so affluent i mean nobody in crypto can curate that type of community it's almost like a priceless crypto community when you think about who holds a pudgy penguin and so you know all the stars aligned i ended up bidding 750 eth which at the time was two and a half million dollars uh they accepted it three months into it uh we closed the deal and then the rest is kind of history what was your first the first thing you did when you when you started first thing i did is i knew You know, what sucks is it wasn't a democratic process. It was really like the highest bidder, you know, bought the project. And I have no interest in running a business, especially a Web3 business, you know, running it like a dictatorship. I think a lot of people think because a business is on the blockchain that it's a Web3 business, and they're actually wrong. I think the difference between a Web2 business and a Web3 business is a Web3 business is a business built with the hive mind that is your community, and that is your superpower. A Web2 business is built in a silo. It's built with your core team team, you know, a bunch of rug rats or rough riders that are rolling up their sleeves and getting shit done. In Web3, you're leveraging your holders and your community to come up with ideas and make decisions as a unit. And I'm really the muscle that is the brain to the community. It's my job to take these ideas, to hear their feedback, extract that feedback, and to build what I think is the best product based on everybody's wants and needs. Obviously, you can't appease to every single person and not every single person is going to be happy. But how do you curate a vision with a group of individuals just because you sell things on the blockchain does not make you a web3 company i'm a firm believer in this i think people have it completely messed up a lot of these nft projects are web2 businesses selling digital products leveraging the blockchain to sell those digital products but they are not web3 businesses so the first thing that i did i went on a one week sprint and i said hey guys i know this wasn't a democratic process i know you did not pick me to be your leader but i'm here to freaking win and i'm here to do this right so we're going to spend the next couple couple of hours for the next week. So a couple hours a day for the seven days. And I want to hear your guys' wants and needs and your vision for the project. And basically my vision for the project completely didn't pivot, but a lot of things changed. And after that one week sprint, I said, let's get to work. Now, mind you, I didn't buy a business. I bought, you know, people, the kids who started Pudgy Penguins were very much kids. They were 18 and 19 year olds in their college dorm basement. They were not entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. So there was no business structure. There was no employee handbook. There was nothing to do about a business. So I spent a couple months standing up the business. I spent a couple months building trust and making sure that the community and I were aligned. And then I spent a couple months following, you know, after that, just executing on what I told them. Within six to seven months, I think the community knew that I was the real deal. Uh, and it's uh, been a wild ride ever since. You talk about being a people pleaser. Yeah. I'm also one. <laughs> But you're able to, to make a difference between business and uh, real life now. Yeah. How do you do that? Enlighten me. <laughs> I'm still not a master at it. I still want to make everybody happy, but unfortunately, like the way the internet works and the way the world works, I'm starting to accept every day that I just can't make every single person happy. And I know I have to stay laser focused on the vision. And eventually I know everyone will be happy once we get to the end destination. And so a lot of that is just filtering out the noise uh, to the best of my ability. What does the end destination look like? Number one NFT project in the world face of crypto and blockchain and nfts and web3 and one of the world's most beloved characters and hot new ip brands which means a lot of physical physical content everything. everything i can see the 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 the, the, the The work on Instagram is amazing. Yeah. It's in such a, such a short amount of time. Yeah. It's very simple, very, very efficient. Yeah. Just like straight to the point. Amazing. Yeah. Very shareable, like lots of views. Amazing. Yeah. Good stuff. We get uh, 50 to 60 million views across all social media every single day across Instagram, Giphy, TikTok, and Facebook. 50 to 60 million a day. No one's doing that. Amazing. Thank you so much for doing this. Yeah. Keep up the amazing work. I appreciate you. Thanks for having me.